quiet center in the crowded life we lead. Find the room for hope to enter. Find the frame where we are freed. Clear the chaos and the clutter. Clear our eyes that we can see. Chaos and the clutter, clear our eyes that we can see all the things that really matter. Be at peace and simply be. Be at peace and simply be. Hi, everybody, and welcome to worship. Before we begin, I do have a few announcements. The first is just a reminder that the deadline for the August Central Light is tomorrow, July 19th. Second, the Church Council postponed our meeting until Wednesday at 6.30, so that's this coming Wednesday, July 21st. And um, finally, last but not least, uh, I just wanted to invite everyone and let everyone know that Ethan Bremner will be singing on Sunday, July 25th during our 1015 a.m. worship service in our sanctuary. So that's always a treat and I would like to invite everyone to be there with us on that day. Now as we turn our minds and hearts to worship, let us consider these words. Come, let us sing about the wonders of God's love. Come, let us share God's faithfulness to all generations. Come, let us declare God's love that stands firm. God's faithfulness is as enduring as the heavens above. Come, let us praise God. The response for our call to worship today is... I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. What a mercy that I am the Lord's forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known God's faithfulness to all generations. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. God's steadfast love endures forever, and nothing can make God turn away from us. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. God's love shall be established forever like the moon, an enduring witness in the skies. Today we keep in our prayers. Brenda Barnes, Kent Lawson, Ron Fournier, Missy Chasen, Laney, Justin Arnott, Bonnie Arnott, and Betty Miller. Our prayer today was written by Reverend Abby. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you have compassion for all of us. In your mercy, O Lord, have compassion for us. Jesus, out of your compassion for us, you invite us to come away with you to a place of rest and quiet. Help us to say yes and then be able to come away with you. Out of your compassion, you care for those who are harassed and helpless and lost. And sometimes, to oh God, we feel that way ourselves. Have compassion for us in your mercy, O Lord. In your compassion, teach us to follow you, to trust you, to love you and love you as you love. 
In your compassion, feed those who are hungry, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. In your compassion, heal us in the places we need to be healed. In your mercy, O Lord, have compassion for us. In your having compassion for us, teach us to have compassion for others as you do. Help us to show compassion in action the way you did. Remind us when it is time to come away with you for quiet and rest. And Lord, in your mercy, have compassion for us today and every day. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture lesson today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verses 30 through 37a, and verses 53 through 56. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a lonely place and rest for a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a lonely place by themselves. Now many saw them going, and knew them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns, and got there ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great throng, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a lonely place. And the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the country and villages round about and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And when they had crossed over, they came to the land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him and ran about the whole neighborhood and began to bring sick people on their pallets to any place where they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces, and besought him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment, and as many as touched it were made well. Here ends our reading. May God add to our understanding of it. I will not soon forget the first time I preached at a church other than Greendale People's Church where I grew up. I was a student minister at Elm Street Congregational Church in Southbridge and had only been there for a few weeks. I didn't know everyone yet and I was very anxious about getting up into the pulpit in front of a new group of people. I must have started to write that sermon at least 25 times, and each time something just wasn't right. I wrote, I thought, I typed, I ripped, I prayed, I cried a lot, I yelled and I erased. Nothing I wrote seemed to be the right words. 
nothing I had to say seemed to be the message that was needed by the congregation. This congregation that I didn't even really know that well. No scripture seemed to inspire me quite enough to write that perfect sermon. And yet time was marching quickly towards Sunday morning. I finally became so frazzled that I called my supervisor in a panic. After I explained the situation, he calmly and simply said to me, Go look up Matthew 6. I'll see you Sunday. Well, that didn't seem to be much help, but I looked up the passage that Pat suggested, and there I read the familiar words. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body. What you will wear is not life more than food, the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? These words were comforting, and while I still didn't have a sermon, I did change a, my mind and my mindset. I started thinking, all that stress and anxiety, and over what? Over sharing God's word and my faith with others. We hear over and over and over again that God will provide for us. We are reminded that God cares for us so much that even the hairs on our head are counted. We are told that God watches out for us so well that God knows when we stand and when we sit. We are told that God knows each of us so intimately that we are God's creation, that God will provide for us, protect us, and guide us. God certainly provided me with the insight, dedication, patience, guidance, and wisdom I needed to finish that first sermon for Elm Street over 20 years ago and continues to provide for me in every way, just as promised. Because I allowed myself to become so stressed and anxious, I had trouble seeing God's answer and God's plan for me, even though it was there all along. Because I had trouble seeing God's plan, I became stressed and anxious. And I think it's fair to say that we all know what it's like to lose sight of God and to lose sight of God's plan because of our anxiety, because we're too busy worrying. We know that God will provide for us, and yet we get anxious. We know that anxiety is not good for us, and yet it takes a hold of us in so many ways. Stress isn't good for us. It's not good for our mental health, our physical health, or our spiritual well-being. We know that God did not intend for us to live in a constant state of anxiety or worry. And yet that's exactly how so many of us live. Commenting on the high level of stress so many people have in their lives, Marilyn Sorensen, author of Breaking the Chain of Low Self-Esteem, writes, People are out of control because they have low self-esteem. High taxes, lying politicians, traffic jams, and exhausting schedules. The demands are endless, and people have not time to themselves or with their families. Some people feel powerless. Powerless. We understand that, don't we? I think we've all felt powerless at some point in our lives. We watch a loved one suffering with cancer 
or Alzheimer's, or some other terrible disease, or addiction. And we know there's nothing we can do to take away their pain or their struggle, and we feel powerless. We watch the bills pile up unpaid because there's no money coming in, or not enough money coming in, and we feel powerless. We look at the world around us and know that there are children who go to bed hungry at night, children who are abused, neglected, and unloved, and we feel powerless. We watch reports of being people being killed in senseless acts of violence, and we feel powerless. And as these feelings of powerlessness grow, our stress levels grow and get higher, and we start to give in to those feelings of inadequacy, and it seems as if all is lost. I know that's exactly how I felt 20 years ago when I was getting ready to preach that first sermon at my student ministry site. I was just finishing up seminary. It had been a tough year. I was going to school full-time, working full-time, and helping out at the dance studio after my nephew was born. It had been an emotional year. My first nephew was born, which was such a joy, but he was born prematurely, and his early days were a touch and go for both he and my sister. I was doing what's called CPE, working as a chaplain. I was also in the middle of the search process for my first job out of seminary, which is a long and stressful process. There had been a few job offers, but nothing that just seemed like the right fit. And I started to cringe every time someone asked me, so how's the job search going? I had all of this going on. And then something happened. I was driving home one day from seminary when I got stuck in a traffic jam. And I could feel that stress level getting higher and higher as I thought about all the things I needed to accomplish while I was sitting there in traffic. And as I sat there stewing, a bumper sticker on the car in front of me caught my eye. The seven little words on it changed my perspective greatly. It said, if God is your co-pilot, switch seats. And that's when it hit me. Of course, I was never meant to be in control. God is in control. My job is to be the co-pilot. My job is to fold the maps and watch for signs and turn on the radio. God's job is to be the pilot, to do the steering, to decide the direction we go. God's in charge, not me. When we hand the steering wheel of our lives over to God, our lives take on a much smoother ride. Granted, it's not an easy thing to do, but the first part of our scripture passage this morning reminds us that God loves us, cares for us, and provides for us. In our passage, there are many examples of God trying to care for us. First, Jesus gathers with his disciples who re are just returning from their individual ministries. They're tired. They're worn out. They're hungry. And Jesus knows these feelings all too well. So he says to them, come away. Come to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest, even just for a little while. Later in the passage, Jesus is teaching the crowds of people who have gathered, and the time is growing late. Knowing that the people in the crowd must be hungry and that there's no food where they have gathered, Jesus instructs his disciples to feed the crowd. At the end of the passage, we are told that Jesus and the disciples healed many people. In fact, they healed all who came seeking healing. 
There's two things that strike me about this passage. The first is that Jesus does, in fact, provide for the people. In all times, in all circumstances, God provides. The other thing that I notice is the role that the disciples take in the story. In part of the story, they are the ones to whom Jesus is caring and offering that caring and nurturing. We see that Jesus encourages them to take their time and make space for themselves for rest. He invites them into that quiet center. But in other instances, we see that it is through these same disciples that God takes care of others. We watch as the dis- Jesus tells the disciples, you give them something to eat. We know that God provides for us. But this passage is a reminder that sometimes God uses us to take care of others. We hear the command, you give them something to eat. But we also must hear the command, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves. Rest a while. Which call is God offering to you today? Whether you are being called in this moment to rest in the quiet center or to serve and care for others, may we seek and may we find that quiet center in which God provides for us and through us. Let us pray. providing, nurturing God. We thank you that in every moment you provide for our needs, that you care for us. We ask that you help us to seek out the times of quiet rest when our souls are weary, but that you energize us and help us to care for others, providing them with whatever it is that they need and sharing your love for us with them. Amen. And now, let us go and do all we have in mind, for the Lord is with us. May we go to love and to serve the Lord, and may the Lord watch between me and thee while we are absent one from the other. Amen. I hope everybody has a great week, and I hope to see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.